Hi. Today, we're looking at a lesson that I titled World of Spirits. And we see some principles dealing with the relationship between the man, the influence that comes upon him from the spiritual realm by intelligences, spiritual. Scripture teaches the history of the human race is the result of the influence of spirit beings. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 2. Where in time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So the scripture is telling us that spirits determine the course of the world. Man does not. Man is a manipulated vessel in the hands of intelligence that he he can't detect or determine. <clears throat> the mind of man has been so corrupted by spirits that God no longer bothers with it. <clears throat> and he's embarked on an entirely different methodology with dealing with the creation. Which brings us to the next principle. Sure. <clears throat> Influence. Okay. There are degrees. Okay. And are they disobedient because of the influence? Or are they desperate? They are disobedient because of the manipulation in the individual's personality. The man is programmed to reject God and the things of God, the Word of God, like we were talking about last night. But you could go as far as saying that they were inherently disobedient, inherently sinful, which of course we know we are. Yes, man is born uh, in a state of rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. uh, Why would he create man knowing already that he was going to be disobedient and knowing that he had free will, that they were going to turn against him? Why would he create? Uh, people in general, all you know, every race, every um, you know, from everywhere, knowing that we're all going to be <coughs> against you, how did he create that in the first place? God does all things wisely. God has a plan. Part of the plan is to create conditions in which man inherently would be um, in an adversarial position because God knew in his wisdom that there would be some men that would lay down their lives for God because of their love for him. The conditions that he created were done so that those who would overcome the adversarial condition would have an opportunity to do so. Sure, but the people don't. People have to be put in a situation where they make a choice. And you're going to have a righteous remnant that makes the right choice. Matter of fact, history is strewn with men who laid down their lives, regardless of the opposition, because they loved God. So as we continue in this progression, you're going to see pressure gets greater and greater and greater. But you're also going to see those who remain loyal to God despite the pressure and the conditions. Love overshadows all 
things. And the love of God is so strong in that individual who has chosen to love him that nothing will be able to deter that pursuit, that relationship, and that love that's once it, he's made his connection. Yes. That highlights a point so that we can understand that God is focused surely on producing something to do that, and therefore that's why we come. But he's not focused on those who are not interested. Right. Although he's provided conditions for them to be interested if they so choose. Right. Of course, they can change their mind. The choice they make, that they make makes them <coughs> basically expendable. So therefore, there's no such thing as this world is fair or this world is not fair. Fair is actually not a word that actually makes any sense in those, under those... Uh, well, in the sense of those who have been put in a position in which they could alleviate the conditions. Right, but you're going to get people who say, since he's a loving God and a fair God, I can, I can you know, run around, not believe in him, not do anything, and nothing will happen to me. You've got that. Yeah, that's, that that, that's, a, that's an essence of ignorance. That's something that the, the, the enemy would put within a man's mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, intrinsically, the scripture tells us that we are to evaluate everything objectively. God gives us all things, but he also gives us the opportunity to pursue for ourselves. It's test all things. Prove me now. And he puts us in this arena with uh, adversarial conditions. And that's all this place is. It's an arena in which those who choose God are going to be testing to see if they really, really love God and how far they'll go right. to, to, to put him first. So now we understand why Paul said exactly what he said, which was he looks for opportunities to oh, yeah. be tested. That's fantastic. Awesome. I'm all this. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we are chosen, we ourselves Life that you're going to have hereafter is contingent upon your possession, your relationship here and now. And like you just said, there's God, I'm not mistaken, you heard you say, that God knows who's going to go to heaven. No, why is he making us go through all this? Because we have the free will to make that choice. Yeah, God knows, yes. we don't. We can be lazy, like you said the other day, you said two to the time before. There's a movie on my Bible space. <laughs> <laughs> something to you on that line. Turn to 2 Timothy 4th chapter. To me, this is what it's all about. 2 Timothy, the 4th chapter. We live in a world that's contrived <coughs> to bring about conditions that will test to see just where, if we profess to be Christians, just where we are at. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. This is Paul Swan song. Verses 6 to 8. For I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is in here. Paul knew that he was going to his death. But we see the attitude, the mindset of Paul. Paul isn't crying out for deliverance, oh God save me. Paul has got two feet firmly planted on the ground, knowing that maybe a couple of minutes from now, he's going to go out and get his head cut off. But what is his thoughts? What is his attitude? Notice what he goes on to say. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So he's appealing to others that have the same mindset. He says, you may wind up in the same situation I am, but if you hold fast, if you fight, then when you enter into the eternal state, you'll know, and even before that, you'll know it's been all worth it. Now drop down to verse um, 16 to 17. This is just the ending of what Paul has been enduring all this time. Watch what he says, verse 16. And my first answer, the word answer there is trial. It's the first trial he's talking about. No man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. They took off. They left Paul totally alone. But Paul stood there, unmoved and unbound. Why? Notice what he goes on to say. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Paul wasn't looking at this life. Paul was looking past this life because he understood the things eternal made the difference. And his focus was on getting everything he could while he could in this life because he knew that this was just a preparation for what he had been called to do in eternity. And Paul basically laid it down. He said, life, my life is not mine anyway. It belongs to the Lord who gave himself for me. So Paul wasn't initiating anything. Paul was responding what had been initiated. Christ laid down his life for Paul. And Paul said, he did that for me out of love. I'm going to do the same thing for him out of love. And exactly what he did. And as you gain that attitude, you understand what's really important in life and what's not, what's trivial. What's important are the things that the Holy Spirit will show you in this life that are of eternal significance. Because in this life, as Paul says, I have fought a good fight. You have to fight. Because you have an enemy that's out to rob everything you have. You have an enemy that's out to try to put you down, stamp you flat, and then sweep away the pieces. You have an enemy that doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, he's consistently trying to beat you down any way he can in every situation that he can possibly engineer in your life. Paul realized that. Paul dealt with it one-on-one. -on -one. He stood flat-footed. He took on the enemy, and he left this world victorious. He said, they haven't beaten me down. I beat them down. I'm entering into eternity. The scripture tells us in, uh, I think it's First Peter, when you leave this place as a victor, there is a welcoming celebration waiting for you as you enter into the gates of eternity. It's like, uh, I picture it as um, uh, a hero coming back from the war. It's an event to come back from World War II, ticker tape parade down Fifth Avenue, that sort of thing. That's exactly what's waiting for the victorious Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about some kind of people who are going to hell. They are sometimes questioning God or sometimes um, why me instead of saying bring it on because yeah. God's going to get me through it and he, you know, yes. like um, this is unimportant. I have Jesus, I have the Holy Spirit, but he had to. When I think about that, it's, it's like too much to take to take in almost. Like, awesome. why complain about anything? Because all of it, God will lose. That's right. And That's right. it's just, it seems so simple, but when you're in it, it doesn't. 
But when you really think about his life, it's like what what had to happen before that transition? Yes. Exactly. And a lot of what had to happen before that transition. Yes. Exactly. And how then he comes in, he loves that little short man. He loves that <laughs> Definitely. he forget about the goodness of God. You know, God does say who test me, but he doesn't have anything else to in his son, there is nothing, if he does nothing else, if he has nothing else to prove, and he does so much for us. And I'm not saying I don't want everything he has for me, but when I really think about everything that he does, protection, help, yes. um, salvation, um, it's like, it's too much. It's like, too, I accept it, but it's too much. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. That's awesome. But you have to see it from God's perspective to reach that point. We see it from a human perspective, and we're going to yeah. do the same thing the Israelites did, carp and gripe and complain, and look at it from a physical standpoint. The injustice of it all. It doesn't make any sense. People reach a stage where they get totally depressed, and they want to you know, take themselves out. <clears throat> That's where, where the enemy tries to get the mind to focus. But when we bring God into the equation, he will lift us to a higher level and give us a perspective from his level. And we can see what's really important and what's trivial. And what's important is the eternal significance of how we deal with the things that we're, the challenges that we're dealing with in life. How do we combat the opposition. Are we willing to fight? Or are we open to just cave because of the pressure? Paul didn't cave. Paul stood firm to the end. And the same thing is true when we, when we seek to see everything that we deal with in this life from God's perspective, then we're, we're never going to cave. And the enemy loses every single. Well, let's go on. That's you know coming from a standpoint that we play in here. You know we got it all, but you really have to have a place, the real thing. I mean, now what if wrong? Uh, hold on a sec. You got a, a, an extra lesson here? Yeah, okay. Tomorrow, you lose your job. Then, you lose your car. Then, you lose your car. Then, you're on the street. Then, you lose a leg. Then, you lose a car. Then, uh, Some of us have, Jeff. I think everyone in here has gone through. And yet here we are. Yeah. 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 Some of us have experienced that. Just 
you know, high in the sky, you know, everything is going to just perfectly right. Uh, God is on his throne and everything is wonderful. Those people, and some of them, believe that until the test came and it wore them down, caused them to commit suicide. Question: Whose fault is that? God's or the person? He is responsible for everything. Sure. So who's responsible for making the decision? Yeah, but who's responsible for making the decision? Yeah, but if you knew that they were going to make that decision, which he does, because that's the only way. But, but the question, can... but the question is, who put themselves in that position? God is eminently just. If a person decides they have free will to make a decision, can you blame God for the person sovereignly making a decision? Would God be just in forcing people to make a decision? Or, or a lot of people just don't even understand their concept. But they don't try. That's the problem. They don't try. They make a decision not to pursue. That's what God holds them responsible for. You talk about a sentient being as an individual who's capable of making decisions. You go out here and you ask the guy that's lying in the street, why you're lying in the street? I gave up. That's a decision he made. Is that God's fault? Is it a decision of rationalism or is it a decision... The rest. It's a decision that the person sovereignly made. You have you can have two people experience the same thing and have two different outcomes. The outcome has to do with the sovereign decision that each person made. God doesn't force anybody to make a decision. He just tells them, here it is, which do you choose? And you find that throughout the Bible. You know, if Jesus chose to sin, God would have allowed it. God didn't cut any slack for his son. Jesus had to do everything he did just like anybody else. But what motivated him was his love for the Father. Does that mean that Jesus, as you would say, could have given up? And lay on the side sure. And said, I'll give up. He could have been a homeless person and just said, hey, you know, I'm the son of God and look where I am. He's going right. to do a pity party. Right. He had free will. He had to. God does one thing. He tells us, choose. Joshua said, choose you now here with whom will you serve? God 
or the guides that your ancestors served on the other side of the flood. Every man has a decision capacity. That's what make, makes him a sentient being. The Israelites, case in point, coming across the Sinai Desert, were told, hey, we're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. You didn't build these cities. You didn't plant these vineyards. It's there waiting for you. All you have to do is walk across till you get there. It's all they had to do. What did they do? Harp and gripe, moan and groan, bicker and complain. And every time they did, God would meet the need. Here's water in the desert. Here's food from the skies. But he got fed up with them making a decision of a lack of faith. Not one time do I read in the scripture where anybody out of the three million came and sat down to Moses and said, Moses, explain to us about this land we're going to. What, what's, what's waiting for us here? Tell us about it. No, they were too busy looking back at the slavery that they came out of wanting to go back. That's a decision they made. And ultimately, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to honor your decision. You're not going to go into the promised land. You're going to die here in this wilderness. Because you said so. Would to God we had died back in Egypt. Would to God we had died in the wilderness. So he said, okay, that's what's going to happen. Yes. I was out there praying. Jesus. Oh, I made a decision. Give it to God. I made a decision. because they want to be out there. We used to feed the homeless. We did it for years. And every week, I have a friend who would come out of his own pocket, $50 a week, making sandwiches right in the back there. And we'd go down to the, we'd go down to Foot Street, we'd go down to the library, we'd hand out these sandwiches, and we would always be a long line of people there to get it. And uh, this situation never changed. The lifestyle. Week after week after week, they were there. And these people you could talk to, they were intelligent. They could hold you a good conversation. They knew what was happening in the world, but they wanted to be where they are because they didn't want responsibility of paying bills. They didn't want responsibility of holding down a job, but they wanted to receive. And that's basically the mindset of most of the homeless people. Yeah, they don't want to put through the effort to go back into society because they see all the pressures of society. And they feel, no, I don't want to deal with all that. I'd rather be out here on the streets. But one day, God's going to hold them responsible. We are put here in this life to be responsible, law-abiding citizen, to have a place of responsibility in society. And if we choose not to, we're going to have to pay a price for that one day. God abides whatever decision a person makes. There's, a, there's an old saying that says that God never sends anybody to hell, they choose to go. 
God will abide by whatever decision you or I make in life. We have challenges, we have obstacles that come our way, but many times it's not pleasant. I know, the, I, I know the feeling of being evicted from an apartment. I know the feeling of being flat on your back, having to have an operation that you can't afford to pay for. I know all of that. But I also know that God has promised to meet our needs. But we have a responsibility to fight, to continue. There's always an option somewhere there. God puts it there for us. And many times it's not easy to grab a hold to. But if we're willing, if we have that mindset to be aggressive, to pursue whatever it is we have to do, God will honor that. God will give us the strength to do it. And God will bring us through every single day. Have you ever been in a hollow? No. Have you ever been in a No. No. Most of that's a choice, though, because I have friends who have. That's not really the deal. Uh, somebody, yes, uh, somebody who gets the leaves, starts moving hot, gets aggressive, gets aggressive. Or they start, you know, drinking young uh, with their father or, you know, buddies, and then progressively goes on. But that is not whether you want to believe it or not. It's something that you cannot control. Uh, and if you don't know anything about God, then that is a profession. And that is something that you cannot just get yourself out of. So Jeff, Jeff, life, Jeff, Jeff, then, Jeff, Jeff. Jeff. My mom died at age 38 of cirrhosis of the liver. I know what an alcoholic is. Okay. Well, then, you know, she had no control. Sure, she did. Sure she did. Everybody makes a choice, Jeff. And some people choose to make the wrong choice consistently. Uh, you, you've never heard, that's, that's the one thing about people who never had a fight those challenges they really don't understand. Because, you know, these people out here fighting those types of things <coughs> don't know God at all, then that's one reason why it, it persists. It stays. But even those that are praying and saying, please release me from this. Because of the addiction being so strong and so long with them, that possession, that demon possession, uh, that um, uh, satanic influence so deeply ingrained in them even though they're praying the power of as we know we alone cannot fight against uh, the spiritual demons and they win every time unless you have God unless you have the power of God operating in your life right. the power of God operating in your life comes from commitment of your life to God. Praying is good. Praying is, is fine. But just sitting there praying and not having the power operate in your life because God is taking you somewhere, wanting you to do something, is another story. Yeah, and if that possession has been ingrained in them to where there are plenty of times I threw a pipe away. I'm not going to do this sometimes. I pray to God. See, I'm not going to do this. But because it's so deep and it lives so long, eventually it comes right back and it went again. And then you throw a clean back again. And then this just keeps going on. It, everybody's like, it's doing some type of vice. They want to be released, they want to quit, but because of them being entrenched in this for so long, uh, it's next to impossible. The only way they usually get out is to die, or uh, those that uh, come to God and try, you know, 
try and start living his way, they are released. Exactly. But exactly. during that time, all the times that they said, I'm quitting, I'm, I'm, I don't want this no more, I want to stop, but it always is there. There has to be a power greater than what's enslaving them. Exactly. And, and the power is there if the person is willing to allow it to operate. It's not just a question of wanting to do it. It's a question of picking yourself up and allowing the power in you to do it and then walk off in the newness of life. Exactly. Is that right, Donnie? Yes. I'm 58 years old. I've had drugs now all my life. I was smoking for drinking, couldn't use it. I didn't got this. I was laughing about money, crying about being other place. But I'm the one who made that decision going, uh, Liquor store, church, liquor store, church. So that was me making that decision. Church. Why would you make that decision? Because I have a free will to make that decision. No, 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 no. <laughs> Why would you have to bet with Why? the key? The <laughs> okay, well, we can we can continue this after the lesson because uh, there are people here that need to hear what we yeah. Sorry about that, folks. It's a good conversation here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Christ. Scripture teaches whether individuals or whole nations, spirits influence men for good or bad. Turn to Numbers, the fourteenth chapter. Verse 22 to 24. We're looking at spiritual influence as the scripture reveals, it affects the lives of men. Numbers 14, 22 to 24. This is Israel at the border of promised land. And <clears throat> they've made a decision that they will not go into the promised land because they're afraid, they're the fear, that they're going to be run out by giants. So as a result of this, the Lord makes a decision. Verse 22, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed that influenced him in a positive way. Only Caleb and Joshua of that whole genera generation went into the promised land because they were under a spirit that enabled them to see things as they were. The rest of the nation were under a spirit of fear. Yes. There are there are positive spirits, there are negative spirits. Let's go on. Isaiah nineteen verse three. This takes place at the second coming. Isaiah 19. And when we get there, we want verse 3. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof. And I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols and to the charmers, to them that have familiar spirits and to wizards. 
This is a spirit that basically is influencing the whole nation of Egypt. They consult it, consort with it. It runs the lives of these people. And at the second coming, the Lord is going to destroy its ability to influence them. And they are, for the first time, going to seek to other spirits for guidance and counsel. One spirit dominating, influencing the whole nation. Genesis 4, verses 6 to 7. Plus, we have the case of Cain. Notice what's <clears throat> being said here. Genesis 4, verses 6 to 7. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, in other words, if you live righteously, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, thou shalt rule over him. Sin is a spirit. He's saying at this time, this goes way back to the history of the beginnings of the human race. Adam's opened the door to contrary spirits to enter into the world again, and they begin to influence men. Cain is a yielded vessel to the spiritual influence of the sin spirit that wants to inhabit him. And he's warned. He says, if you continue to do the things you're doing, you go the way you're going, the sin spirit is going to enter into you and become a permanent part of your life and you'll spend your life trying to control its desires to incite your own emotions. And of course, he didn't heed the counsel. He went and killed his brother, and that's exactly what happened to him. Turn to James, fourth chapter, verse 5. Not only did it happen to him, it happened to everybody that sinned. James, the fourth chapter, and the Hebrews, verse 5. James 4, verse 5. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? There's a sin spirit in every human being. That's why this prince of the power of the air is able to manipulate. He manipulates the sin spirit that's in man, this corrupted man, to the point where man come under a judgment. Turn to Romans 5, chapter Romans, Romans, the fifth chapter. When you get there, we want verse 12. To verse 14. Romans 5, verse 12 to 14. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Adam opened the door <clears throat> to the sin spirit and the spirit of death entering into this pristine paradise. It's called earth. Once it entered, <clears throat> it came upon men. <clears throat> Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon 
all men, for that all have sinned. Cain sinned. He killed his brother. The sin spirit began to indwell into him. It became a generation curse upon the generations of human beings. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. The law of sin and death is not triggered unless there's an act that breaks it. Break the law of sin, then there's a response. A demand is necess uh, necessitated to make up for the transgression. Verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him who was to come. In other words, men didn't do what Adam did. Adam disobeyed the command to eat of the fruit. When he did that, he sinned. And when he sinned, he opened the door for sin and death and all the other contrary spirits to enter in again. When they did, they influenced all men to sin. And therefore, sin came upon every individual. Scripture tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so it became a generation curse on the human race. And as David said, an iniquity was I conceived. Every one of us has a sin spirit dwelling within us. Sure. You live by the new nature, but you have dual nature. You live by the flesh, and you're going to sin. This is why we have to fight. Can you very briefly give us um, some examples of spirits who are not angels but are positive? Who are not angels but what? Positive? Are positive spirits. Um, is there any Ephesians? Second chapter. <coughs> he could give us some examples of spirits who are not angels but are positive. Yeah, yeah. positive spirits who are not angels. Just you know, so we can get them on the these are the second chapter, verses 16 to 17. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the Greek, it's a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Sorry, the piece of the second chapter. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, piece of the first chapter, <laughs> verse 16 to 17. We've got number two here, but this is still the first chapter. Verse 16 to 17, I'll read it again. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, they give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the original Greek, it's a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of And the spirit of wisdom and revelation is a separate entity to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah I always thought that was the Holy Spirit. Me too, until I read the original Greek. Yeah. Yes. Angels. Well, there are differences between angels and spirits, although angels are called spirits. There's a difference. The angel is a sentient being who has a body. Spirits, the original word for spirit is pneuma, breath, wind. They're non corporeal, but they manifest in influence. 
you have a spirit or a breath of life that animates us and enables us to live in this life. It's not a corporeal being, it's a wind, it's a, a, a nebulous, non-corporeal essence that imparts a particular influence. <laughs> yeah. That's as much as I like Star Wars. <laughs> but let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches in the future, spirits and spirit beings will dominate as never before. In other words, we're looking at a history of what the spirits have done in the human race. In the future, it will pale into insignificance what they will do. So we have, at this time, we have no idea what that's going to look like. Not in its fullness. We're going to take a look at some examples. In the future, spirit and spirit beings will dominate as never before. They will terrorize man, unlike any human tyrant has ever been able to terrorize. This will happen after the rapture. Turn to Revelation 6, chapter, verse 8. Sure. That's the Holy Spirit. Love is a state of being, characteristic of God. Revelation, sixth chapter, verse eight. <coughs> This is when the, uh, the seventh seal mystery scroll is opened and events begin to take place on earth. This takes place after the rapture. You see an example of this. Verse 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and, him, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. These are two <coughs> spiritual beings, fallen angelic beings, spirits nevertheless, and they will take out a third of the human race through different means, inciting wars, inciting violence, inciting vitriol, hatred that will cause men to turn on each other, they will incite the animals to turn on people uh, until a third of the human race is wiped out. Now, as a result of this, the human race is going to be in a state of terror of these two beings. And <clears throat> scripture teaches these two spirit beings torment men so horribly that man makes a covenant with them. Turn to Isaiah 28 verses 14 to 18. Isaiah 28, verses 14 to 18. This is an, an example of the spiritual influence that will overcome, dominate the human race after the rapture takes place. I'm sorry, uh, fallen beings. I believe that they're spirits rather than angels. But they're powerful beings, spiritual beings in that context. Okay, we're looking at Isaiah 28, verses 14 to 18. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, be scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. So Israel is going to make a covenant with these two beings. 
that in this covenant they will agree not to carry out this tremendous torment and terror that's going to take place across the earth. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a cried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. And of course he's talking about the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be annulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scores shall pass through, and you shall be trodden down by it. It looks like once the Gentile Satan tries to imitate God when God uh owed an uh Israelite. They put blood over the door and the spirit of his dead came by and took all the uh, firstborn and those who had the land's blood over the doorway and passed by. Right. So this is his version of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He uh, promises protection from the scourge when they pass over. Now, <clears throat> this may ring a bell with you. Scripture teaches when the Antichrist appears, he will take this covenant and he will expand it including many more. This will be for a seven-year period. Turn to Daniel, the ninth chapter, verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many. Now, people assume that the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel. It's not what the scripture says. It says he confirms the covenant. The word confirm there means to strengthen. He confirms the covenant with many for one week. Of course, it's not a week of days. It's a week of years, seven years. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspawning of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. In other words, <clears throat> the covenant is going to be broken when he stands in the temple and declares himself God. He shuts down the sacrifice to uh, YHVH, to Jehovah, and he establishes his domination over the earth as God of God. And uh, then we'll realize that um, <clears throat> it didn't pay to enter into an agreement with him because he will take over Israel. And, uh, the great tribulation will then begin. Spirits are going to tremendously influence man in the tribulation period. Scripture teaches the world will be filled with demon spirits influencing and controlling man everywhere. Go to Revelation 9, verse 20 to 21. Is that a uh, lesson for Ishmael? Revelation 9, 
verse 20 to 21, the human race is so caught up in worshiping, idolizing spirits, the Lord pours out a judgment on them that takes out another third of the human race. <clears throat> Pick it up after this judgment is passed. Verse 20, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, they should not worship devils, demons, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So they won't repent of worshiping spirits or being under spiritual influence, even though a third of the human race gets wiped out for doing so. Now we're going to take a look at the influence of these spirits on men. Everybody, the human race, with the exception of those who have the Holy Spirit in them, is going to be under a spiritual influence to one degree or another. Most will be under the control of some spirit. Spirits are going to exercise tremendous power, supernatural power. Turn to Revelation 16, verses 13 to 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracle. These are miracle-working demons. Which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So they gather all the kings, the rulers, their armies, so I'm getting through this deception of miracle working <clears throat> deceit that comes from Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist, the beast. Miracle working demons are going to influence all from the single individual to the whole human race. Turn to Revelation 13. Yes. All this time doing different things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Revelation 13, verses 11 to 15. Here we see the false prophet. And I held another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him, causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the sight on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them <coughs> that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. The word life there in the Greek is spirit. So he puts within this statue that the world has made in the image of the Antichrist a miracle working demon that brings this thing to life. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, the number of his name. So this is a demon that brings about 666. and everything that goes along with it. Miracle-working demons are going to be <clears throat> in 
position in which they dominate the activities of events in the tribulation period. Turn to Zechariah, 13th chapter, verses 1 to 5. Zechariah 13, verses 1 to 5. Now this takes place at the second coming and it deals with the cleanup of the part of the sons of God, getting rid of all these spirits and their influence off the earth. Zechariah 13, we want verses 1 to 5. In that day, there shall be a mount, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. It was going to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Now, basically, what's being done here is everybody has been under the influence of the Spirit. The whole nation of Israel has been under the influence of demon spirits. Some have been idol worshippers, and they ultimately they re 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 reject this, they repent, cast away their idols, and the influence of the demon spirits are broken. But the spirits and the people that are in house that are in house are still there at the second coming. The Lord comes back, they set up judgment. And these spirits, <clears throat> along with the vessels that are in them, are judged and they're cast off the earth. Now notice it says the prophets. What is referring to a false prophets? Miracle working demons <clears throat> in human vessels that have been going around doing miracles. Verse 3, and it's come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, and his father or his mother that begot him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. So this is referring to the false prophets that have repented and renounced that they will be incorporated into this society and just as the rest of the population will have been cleansed of the demonic influence, so will they. As a matter of fact, they will have a rough time for a while because of what they had done. And shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall he they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. So basically, <clears throat> what's being said is anybody that has a demon spirit in him that prophesies will be killed. And everyone to whom the demon has been cast out, will renounce <clears throat> what he was and declare the name of the Lord and repent and he'll be forgiven. Now, turn to Matthew 24. And you see how influential they have been during the tribulation period. Verse, Matthew 24, verse 11. 
Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now drop down to verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. But this refers to Jews and Gentiles who have miracle working demons <coughs> controlling them in which they will go forth and deceive people of God, Jew and Christian saints <coughs> until course, it's dealt with at the second coming. So there you see just a vignette of the influence of spirits once they are allowed to have their full reign in the earth. The human race won't stand a chance. Yeah. Uh, to, 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 they have to go up to a battle in which he's killed. 